Bonjour. Since uh, almost 50 years, I've been wallowing in the tropical rainforest and especially in the river beds. Why? Because I love aquatic plants since I'm a teenager and I had aquariums and especially the genus Cryptocorine with so many species, about 60 now uh, recognized in Southeast Asia. So in the early 60s, many cryptocorines were imported to aquarium shops. And for me, it was a dream because uh, I didn't know that these plants were coming from the original forest and uh, that very special leaves changing when they were growing in aquarium. So when you are a teenager, you are really surprised by these plants from so far. And uh, finally, I decided when I was 19 years old in the early 70s that I wanted to go to Malaysia and Thailand in order to try to find this cryptocorine. Of course, I did find very few of them the first time because I had not so many documents to know the ecology of these plants, but I did discover the tropical rainforest. And for me, it was really the decision to work in tropical botany. So at the university in Paris, I did follow all the courses in tropical botany. My PhD was devoted to the family of cryptocorines, the RAC. And finally, at the CNRS, National Center of Scientific Research, I did work on the plants growing in the shade of tropical rainforest. I mean, the plants receiving only 1% of full sunlight reaching the canopy of the forest. Now, impossible to travel since about one year due to the COVID all over the world. So with Pascal, Pascalini, who is doing all our films, our field trip films, we did decide to try to look at all the sequences he had the opportunity to film during so many years in Asia. And we did select all the places during 10 years following me among the cryptocorine. Now they are quite well protected, of course, because they are no longer imported. But of course, we know that tropical forests are disappearing also, but we hope the future will be good. But now, I hope you'll enjoy this film by Pascal following my trips with cryptocorine in many countries of Asia, in Myanmar, in Malaysia, in Thailand, in uh, Vietnam, Laos, etc., in Singapore also, because we are still live finding some aquatic plants in Singapore. So I hope you enjoy. Au revoir. Sungai Selarung, donc euh, dans cette réserve forestière de Pondok Tanjung, il est censé y avoir deux espèces de cryptocorines. Le biotope semble parfait, pourtant là, on ne voit rien. Ah oui, mais alors là, là il y a quelque chose. Ouh, ça a bien l'air d'en être. Alors je ne m'attendais pas du tout à les trouver sur un, un talus. On voit que l'eau normalement est beaucoup plus haute, puisqu'on voit bien que ces feuilles-là ont été sous l'eau avant. Je ne vais pas la traverser là parce que c'est un peu profond. Mais visiblement de là-bas, on peut y accéder. Ah, j'aperçois les choses. Alors... Ah bah oui, aucun doute. Aucun doute. Aucun doute, aucun doute. Ce sont des cryptocorines. D'après la feuille, il me semble que c'est plutôt minima, celle-là. En tout cas, ce sont bel et bien les fameuses cryptocorines. Je ne m'attendais pas du tout Allez voir sur une pente comme cela. Ah, mais voilà une aflo. Ah, il y a une fleur. Et voilà une petite inflorescence. 
Ah bah oui, c'est... Visiblement, c'est minima, celle-là. Puis ta fluorescence pourpre. Elle est pourpre, maculée. Oui, cette cryptocorine minima, puisqu'il semble bien que ce soit minima celle-là, est vraiment euh, caractéristique de cette zone du nord de la Malaisie. On ne la trouve que dans, que dans ces zones euh, du nord-ouest euh, de, la, de la péninsule malaise. Euh, bien sûr, comme euh, elle est liée aux rivières les moins perturbées possibles de basse altitude, et qu'on sait que toute la basse altitude a été transformée en plantation de palmiers à huile, et des VA. Là, heureusement, c'est une réserve forestière, donc euh, elle peut subsister puisqu'il reste quelques grands arbres de forêt quand même qui lui font de l'ombre. Mais à côté de soi, on voit, on voit la dégradation totale du milieu. La route était à 50 mètres. Les palmiers à huile sont derrière moi. Mais par miracle, ce petit ruisseau est protégé. Quand on voit la, qualité, la couleur de l'eau, bien, bien rouge, bien chargée d'acide humique, tout ça semble en assez bon état. Et pour que les cryptocrines soient là, il faut que ce soit peu perturbé, effectivement. C'est la première fois que je vois une population cryptocorine sur une petite, un petit talus, comme ça. En tout cas, on a la chance qu'il n'ait pas plu depuis un certain nombre de jours, puisque du coup, l'eau est claire et elle est assez basse, donc elles sont en partie émergées. Mais on voit bien, d'après les feuilles plaquées, que, pas, que ces feuilles ont été formées sous l'eau et qu'elles ne sont pas très à l'aise en étant émergées ainsi. Ça ne m'empêchera pas de les prendre en image, bien évidemment. Bon, apparemment, c'est la seule en fleurs. Ah non, il y en a une autre là, qui émerge juste de la boue. Voilà, une autre inflorescence, avec un superbe collerette centrale. C'est sûr qu'on n'est pas sur des plantes gigantesques. Hein. Elle s'appelle Minima, c'est pas pour rien. Elle est vraiment petite, une des plus petites espèces connues. Ah oui, là, j'ai vu la petite très très pâle, quasiment blanche. Oui. Comme quoi la couleur est variable. La minéralisation, c'est rien du tout. Il y a 20 micro siemens donc euh, quasiment de l'eau distillée. Quand on compare aux 500 de nos eaux du robinet habituelles, voilà le pH de l'eau est légèrement acide, mais pas du tout très acide, comme dans certains cas où ça descend à 4,5. Là, on est à 6,1, donc c'est un pH légèrement acide, mais sans excès. Ça me gratte. On voit les feuilles, du lait, ce qui est mon cas souvent du courant. Là, on voit bien sur celle-là, là, là les... La surface foliaire bien bien bulleuse. On voit vraiment la taille de la plante qui est vraiment réduite. Parfois les feuilles sont plus brunes. Donc on voit toute la petite population. Les jeunes feuilles qui se déroulent. Et la proximité de l'eau évidemment. On est un peu inquiet pour l'avenir de cette réserve forestière de basse altitude, puisque les cryptocorines ont quand même aussi cette caractéristique. C'est vraiment de très bons indicateurs de forêts primaires de basse altitude, peu ou pas perturbées. Là, c'est encore très perturbé, elle subsiste encore, mais pour combien de temps Cette forêt est perturbée peut-être depuis 30 ou 40 ans. Donc, mais est-ce que ce n'est pas simplement une relique qui va disparaître euh, dès que tout ça va continuer à se couper autour et que le milieu sera de plus en plus modifié. Mais euh, hélas, on risque d'être encore de ce monde nous-mêmes pour voir que des populations comme ça peuvent disparaître, des populations de plantes, j'entends, puisqu'on voit vraiment tous les vestiges de la forêt. Là, on voit le, ce pandanus aquatique qui est là, cette petite espèce. 
de pandanus qui est là, qui elle est vraiment typique de forêt primaire. On voit un aglaonema qui est là, on voit ce schismatoglottis là, avec ses feuilles triangulaires, et tout ça mélangé au, à ce, 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 cet afreuclidemia irta, qui est donc euh, cette mélastomatacée envahissante d'Amérique du Sud. Donc là, on voit vraiment qu'on est sur un milieu très tangent où les, les espèces vraiment forestières subsistent et à côté de ça, quantité d'envahissantes de, d'autres de, zones tropicales apparaissent. Mais on verra, il faut rester optimiste. De toute façon, tant que je vois Cryptocorine Minima qui pousse là, malgré ces perturbations, je reste forcément optimiste. Ça me grattait. Voilà, voilà une sensu étonnante. Hein. <rire> J'ai jamais euh... vu de ma vie. C'est une espèce aquatique, donc on va essayer de. Elle est quand même très très belle. Et oui, elle me gratte. Ça va gratter longtemps. Putain, mais elle se raccroche, tu l'enlèves. Allez, on la libère. On la remet dans l'eau, puisque pas moi elle est aquatique. Ça va saigner. Attends, attends, mais là c'est un, un trou gigantesque qu'elle t'a fait. Ah ben oui, <rire> j'ai jamais eu une sensu de cette taille-là de ma vie. Il y a une plante très rare, un cryptocorine Schulzei qui est connu que de très très peu de stations entre Kota Tinggi et Mersing, donc sur la côte est de la Malaisie, hein, dans l'état de Johor. Et là c'est euh, un endroit que j'avais trouvé tout à fait par hasard quand on s'était arrêté il y, a, il y a trois ans et ça avait été la surprise d'apercevoir cette cryptocrine que je pensais être Shuzei. Et puis après en regardant dans la bibliographie, j'ai vu que effectivement à, ici il y a Utan Lipur Panti, la Recreation Forest de Panti, qui est une colline qui est juste derrière. Eh bien, effectivement, c'est de là que vient euh, Cryptocorine Shuzei, de quelques autres stations vers Mersing. On va voir si on les voit en fleurs. Attention. Je marche. L'inflorescence de Cryptocorine Shuzei. Deux inflorescences. Une parfaitement épanouie. On voit très bien le pavillon jaune, la collerette pourpre. La chambre où sont les fleurs là, se situe à la base, donc sous le niveau de l'eau dans la boue. Et c'est là que les insectes, pénétrant par le pavillon, descendront pour assurer la fécondation. Très très belle feuille avec des macules brunes. Sous ce, ce milieu pourtant un peu artificialisé, puisque on est sous un pont suspendu. Donc voilà, Barkeria Motli et Cryptocoin Shuzi survivent dans cet endroit entièrement dégradé et reconstruit par l'homme, survivent uniquement sous la passerelle qui les met dans une ombre euh, forte et donc euh, les plantes envahissantes de lumière ne les atteignent pas et elles en plus supportent beaucoup mieux la faible lumière. Là-bas, j'ai vu la population, euh, petite population de cryptocorine graffiti. J'espérais la voir en fleurs parce que les eaux sont basses, mais elle n'est pas en fleurs. J'ai eu très chaud parce qu'il n'y a pas un souffle d'air. Voilà, population de cryptocorine graffiti dans son biotope avec les feuilles complètement recouvertes de limon, donc déjà qu'il y a peu de lumière en sous-bois, il y a encore moins de lumière puisque les feuilles sont recouvertes, donc elles sont enracinées là-dedans, dans cette espèce de, de boue rouge d'humus accumulé, on voit les feuilles qui apparaissent sous les feuilles mortes des arbres, un biotope qui pourrait paraître très peu confortable mais qui convient en fin de compte tout à fait à ces cryptocorines graffiti.
Deux jours après, ce petit capet se dessèche et ils ressortent avec le pollen de cette fleur-là. Alors qu'ils sont arrivés avec le pollen de l'autre, ils ont fécondé les fleurs femelles en bas. Pourquoi aller chercher un truc aussi compliqué pour féconder C'est quoi l'intérêt C'est ben, assez malin, ça permet de vivre dans l'eau, dans un milieu où pas d'autres ah, plantes vivent. Si okay. tu veux, d'avoir les fleurs sous l'eau, mais à l'air. Ah oui, ok, ça y est. Quand même ah, assez, oui. euh, ça permet d'avoir une niche écologique qui, qui, qui est pupée par personne d'autre. Bon, moi je vais essayer de récupérer. Il ne faut pas oublier celle-là là, qui est très ouais, bien. Okay. Je rends le couteau parce que pour dans l'eau, c'est un couteau. Ah oui, tiens, merci. Hein, tu de... fais attention aux échantillons. Ouais. J'ai essayé d'aller euh... les... dans l'eau pour essayer d'avoir les plus longues. Attention, tu vas te mouiller là. Oui, mais... Elles sont belles. Voilà. Bon, les beaux échantillons là. Oui, parce que l'insecte le... rentre, il a déjà du. du... Il pénètre, le clapet se referme et donc il farfouille au niveau des fleurs femelles, dépose le pollen et deux jours après, le clapet se dessèche et les fleurs mâles sont mûres. Bah, tu m'as mis retassé, mais je ne peux pas dire plus. Réophyte, on peut dire. Hein. Et, et arbustif. Ah, mais... C'est voilà. arbustive et réophyte. Voilà. Réophyte, ça permet déjà, il suffit d'aller dans le vent de tennis et on peut s'y retrouver, peut-être. En tout cas, c'est le maximum qu'on puisse dire pour elle. Je trouve ce qui fait le mérite de cet endroit, c'est qu'il y a des milieux très différents à très courte distance. Oui. Très, très oui. rapide. Depuis les cryptocorines oui. du fond de l'eau <rire> jusqu'au sommet des cars, c'est vrai que les six cars, enfin, c'est vrai. Ne nous trompons pas. Les néons, hein, ça fait pas une lumière pastoche hein, pour déterminer. Ça, c'est autre chose, c'est un petit peu C'est quelle plante ça C'était au début. Ah, le petit à cantassé à fleur blanche. Ouais. Ouais. On a été euh, assez col ici en, en une grosse heure. Quoi. Le chemin n'est pas trop mauvais. Voilà, a very beautiful population of a cryptocorine affinis. This species is typical of water flowing around, around the caves, limestone caves, because it likes a lot of limestone in water, and it's a, a very beautiful patch of cryptocorine affinis. A wonderful population of Cryptocorine ciliata, the very common species all over Southeast Asia and also India. It is typical of uh, these uh, habitats in a tidal, strong tidal influence. But what's important is that all the leaves are totally covered with mud, and this mud actually protects them from the strong sun. So, Cryptocorine ciliata has two protections against strong sun midday, like now. First, the leaves are oriented vertically, so of course the impact of, uh, of the strong light uh, of the sun is really, really weakened. And also the leaves are totally greyish, covered with mud, which protects them also against the strong light. We see that this individual in the shade, overshaded by trees, instead of having upright standing leaves, has totally curved leaves. 
Uh, so, because it is shaded, so we see clearly the adaptation to the strong light with upward leaves. We are in the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. It's a part of the primary forest, supposed to be primary, of course a little bit logged. Uh, primary forest in the center of Singapore, in the, in the center of the island. And this uh, patch uh, of forest is uh, covering a hill, a little bit less than 200 meters high, so not a big hill. And here is a very interesting plant. It's a member of the genus Cryptocorline. This plant is supposed to be the only endemic species now alive among angiosperms in Singapore. I know it very well because actually if I became a botanist it's because I did love the cryptocorine since uh, oh, almost uh, 50 years ago now when I was a child and I had uh, in my aquarium this uh, cryptocorine. I did love them, I did grow them in aquariums and uh, I decided when I was 19 years old to come to Asia, to Malaysia and Thailand to try to see them. So I did see at the beginning few species because I was a young student at 19. I did not know very well which were the good places. But I came back many, many times and I did see quite many now, quite many species of cryptocorine, both in Sumatra, in the Peninsula Malaysia, in Borneo, in Thailand, Vietnam, so in many places. And this species, I did find it for the first time in 1991, so it's 22 years ago. I was visiting uh, Bukit Tima for my research on understory plants, and I did see this plant, which was for me very strange, and I did uh, explain this to Hank Pintai, who was at the head of the botanical garden for all the botany at that time, 22 years ago. And uh, we did have a look in uh, the herbarium sheets, we did see nothing similar to this, so I did make good specimen for herbarium I did deposit in Singapore herbarium. My specimen, of course, still here. Ten years later, in 2001, Jan Bastmeyer and the Ruth Q, they did see again this plant and finally they did see it was something new. Of course, in herbarium they did find also my specimen I collected ten years before that uh, with the explanation saying it was a very strange plant. There were many inflorescences but no fruits at all, no capsular fruits at all. So pollen was probably a little bit defective and of course analysis of the pollen did show that it was almost totally defective, deceptive, so uh, it did mean that fecundation was impossible, probably because it was of a hybrid origin. So actually when they did describe the, the species, they did suggest that the possible parents for this hybrid could be cryptocorine graffiti, in my opinion, actually the two parents for this species are Cryptocorine Nourii from Southern Peninsula Malaysia and Cryptocorine Schulzei also from Southern Peninsula Malaysia. None of these two species is present in Singapore. And what is very strange is that we can see that this only place in the world where this plant up to now has been found. It is very strange because just as we can see, this is a totally artificial place. It is a dam, a small dam built uh, by the Japanese during World War II. So what is most probable? In the 40s and 50s, a very famous botanist, uh, Holtum, uh, who did work on monocots and also especially on the ginger family, did find this plant, probably in the state of Johor in the uh, southern part of the peninsular Malaysia, 
as it was Tuan Shuabe, he did collect it and he did introduce this plant. So maybe about 60 years ago in these new artificial dams. So it is the most probable solution that actually it is a natural hybrid in Malaysia. And recently, at the, in the northern part of Johor, close to Pahang State, hybrid has been found which looks very like this one. But anyway, this one has the name of a species, so it is called Cryptocorine timahensis from Bukit Tima. But as it is of hybrid origin and is sterile, there is a X just before the name, so it is Cryptocorine X timahensis. So the up to now, the only part of the world where we can find this plant is here. Because maybe, of course, if Old Tom did introduce or somebody else from Peninsular Malaysia, probably the station, because now there are so many oil palm plantations, probably the, the plant is no longer alive in Malaysia. Here, beautiful population, and we see the so beautiful inflorescence, the spata, yellowish, and many are in flower. I just want to measure the total amount of minerals in the water, I think it's a very low amount. So zero, 35, 40 micro cements. It means it's very, very pure water. It's almost uh, demineralized water. Of course, no calcium because it's uh, not at all a limestone here, here. And very low amount of nutrients, but it's not a problem, the plants are perfectly thriving with this low amount. So we see the inflorescence, but what is very important, we see that all the leaves are covered by dead leaves, mud, amount of light they receive, it looks exactly like dead leaves, except we see the so beautiful inflorescence. So it means that the plants in the shaded parts like here receive a very low amount of light because we know that it's about 1% of full sunlight reaching the soil of the tropical rainforest. But in this case, when the leaves are totally covered with muddy loam, of course, the amount of light they receive is still lower. So this cryptocoran with quite wide ovate leaves usually are in quite standing water. But the other, main other species live in very fast flowing water and usually they have very long leaves, often very bullate and they have a very good resistance to the very fast flowing water. So it's a called these ones of course as rheophytic species, but these ones are not at all rheophytic species. It's so beautiful to see so many inflorescences everywhere. I think there are at least 20 different spata in full bloom. It's very beautiful. So I'll go back and living my dearest cryptocorine here alone in the forest stream. Uh, yeah, here, <laughs> here is a clump, totally immersed of cryptocorine, siamensis, actually it's not siamensis, it's cryptocorine, cordata, the variety siamensis, with its perfect inflorescence, with a yellow throat, and the spata, at the, in the higher part, which is a little bit warty and a little bit greenish. So it is totally immersed here on this bank, sandy bank. During high waters, of course, it is totally submerged, but it can survive quite well immersed. Leaves are somewhat belated in some cases. New leaves appear even out of water. But what is very beautiful is the pure yellow spata. It is common in Southern Thailand, but I did never see this variety. I didn't know 
quite well the Quaptocorin cordata, the variety cordata, which is from the Malay Peninsula, and also a little bit in the northeastern Thailand, in the Naratewat province. It is quite different actually, it has very long tube of the spata, and chromosome number also is different. I've just seen a population of uh, the Cryptocorine uh, Cordata siamensis, but in full sun because many trees have been recently destroyed. But anyway, here we see the summer beautiful population with reddish brownish underside of the leaves. Leaves are somewhat bullet, as we see. So this, uh, I don't know this form, but. Actually, as all the population are separated, of course, according to the different streams, we can find different types of plants. And we see this one is very bullet, which is not so common in this Coptocorin cordata, but it, we see it is totally burnt by sunlight. Now I want to measure the total concentration of the dissoluted mineral in this water. Only about 20 microsimons of Almost no minor walls in this water. So here we see clearly the purple, totally purple undersurface of the leaves. This is a very beautiful population, it's a much more protected place. We see the bullet leaves and it is very well growing as patches through runners. There are runners in the sand and we see that the soil actually is totally sandy. It's a sand, pure sand, so few amounts of nutrients. But for these plants, it's not a problem. Some are growing very deep, because we see here, they are maybe 50 centimeters deep. Yes, and you know, 30, 35 centimeters. Cryptocorin albida. This is a brown leafed form, and uh, now in uh, close to this uh, waterfall in the Sipanga National Park, it is growing totally immersed. Of course, now is the dry season, but some of them are probably always above the water level. And uh, this form so has purple leaf, and just here we see a, a grass. <laughs> it's uh, so many individuals, totally green. They doesn't look at all like uh, cryptocorines, they look much more like uh, grass. The inflorescence of spata is almost white, so albus means uh, white in uh, Latin, so albida is a good name for this species. We see a patch of a uh, Coptocorine albida hanging 
vertically from the rock among the mosses. This is the first time I see a cryptocorine species able to live on vertical space, vertical rocks like this. I didn't know when Lagenandra in Northern India is able to live like this, but this, it, it is finally a rheophytic species. But otherwise, cryptocorine albida can also very well thrive in a horizontal standing water. But here, it's also a perfectly natural habitat. This is a green form. It has green leaves and not brown leaves, but maybe we don't see some brown individuals. So totally living in the spray of the waterfall. Population of the Cryptocorine albida fixed under granitic rocks in its rheophytic habitat because this species is mostly a rheophytic species which is immersed during the dry season now because now is mid January and it is flowering at that time and we see, of course, the spata and these plants are totally fixed in the cracks of the granitic rocks, it is impossible to remove them. And they are, even when water is flowing very, very fast, no problem, even if some leaves are damaged, all the basal parts of the stems, the rhizomes, are totally protected in the cracks of the rock. And we see the population exactly follows all the small cracks. This is a brown form because all the leaves are brown due to anthocyanic in the cells and also we can see on, on some other patches are green so as usual for understory plant we have a mix of a population mixed of green and brown individuals but in this case actually this crop to Koran is not an understory species because it's living in full sun so it's not so common to have these two forms here. Also when growing in the soil in pebbles they are deeply anchored due to contractile roots which are pulling them down at many centimeters, usually at least five or six centimeters. So what we see actually emerging is the sheath of the leaf, but the apex of the stem is about three, four, five centimeters below the surface of the ground. Thousands of Cryptocorine albida, the green form, totally carpeting the sides of this small river in the Sipanga National Park, at the limit of Sipanga. So they are growing and propagating through runners close to the mother plant. Uh, we see that uh, 
The water is uh, not really fresh water, it's a brackish water. And just in front of us, what I see, I see Cryptocorine ciliata, the only Cryptocorine growing in this marshy, brackish areas. It can withstand very strong concentration of salt, but also it can withstand pure fresh water. But here in this case, it's a mix. So it's the biggest cryptocorin. It's a, it has a very wide distribution from India to Papua New Guinea. It's the only species with so wide distribution, but I'm always happy to see it again. We see that there are strong difference of level between high tide and low tide because I see on these leaves all the deposits of mud. So probably in a few hours it will be totally covered by water. And, uh, the banks of this uh, river near Capoe, south of Ranong. I see a population of a cryptocorine. Maybe it's a cryptocorine albida or cryptocorine crispatula. Impossible to know because I see no flower. But what is very interesting, here we see the plants with the leaves. But I was very surprised by all these uh, strange stems with a kind of a bulb at the top. And actually, these are the cryptocorine partly excavated by the river and here we see clearly that these stems are really stems of cryptocorine. Usually they are deeply buried into the soil and uh, into the gravel to resist to very strong current because we see it's a strong current so this is a rheophytic species. It, of course during the wet season when water is higher it is totally submerged and it produces submerged leaves but now it survives perfectly with immersed leaves so maybe it's albida or maybe a form of a crispatula maybe crispatula flaxidifolia it's difficult to know at this stage maybe we'll see in another place submerged one but it's very interesting to see these strong stems very firmly uncorned to the soil. We see very strong root system and especially these roots which are contractile roots because we can see some rings along the roots and they are contractile so it takes the stem deeper and deeper into the soil. So of course even if the higher part is destroyed, all the lower parts can withstand the very strong current of the water. And we see they have alternation of very thick part of the stem with many, many leaves crowded together with short internodes and other parts a little bit like stolons with much more spaced leaves and then again a rosette, a rosette of leaves here at the top. So we see they can be very well adapted to these changes of water depth and current by alternation of long part of stems, long internals and shorter parts along the stem. Palm tree? Yes, yeah, a palm. Uh, I don't know at all. Uh, maybe a salaka. 
but uh, I've never seen a palm like this, uh, rheophytic also. I'm uh, now among uh, Arase with the long peciole, probably belonging to the genus uh, Homalomena here, because so many schismatoglottis and Homalomena in the lowlands of Borneo, in Gunungmulu here, but uh, if I stay here, it's because there is a very beautiful population of Cryptocorine longicoda. And now it's very dry spell, so they are totally immersed, but usually all the leaves are under water. We see the perfect bullate, very beautiful bullate leaves, and usually only inflorescence is emerging. And here we see one inflorescence, longicoda. We can understand why, because when we see this so long tail, longicoda means long tail, it is the extremity of the spata, which is a very long tail. And here it's not yet open, but it will be totally dark purple. the tube which usually is under water and the flowers actually are at the bottom we can see this white <laughs> dilated chamber and all the flowers are here usually under water now it's a special dry spell so the inflorescence is totally out of the water but even if it's out of the water the soil is very 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 wet of course and the leaves stay among the little leaves of the tree so they cannot dry out. So it's a beautiful population. Of course I detect this way in order not to squash the plants.
Ja, super. Ja. So, <laughs> along the banks of the river from uh, from the raft, I did see a very strange, bright green patch and uh, I wanted to stop and it was a good idea to stop because it is a cryptocorine and since there are only two species in this area in northern Burma, only the common cryptocorine retrospiralis but it has very narrow cylindrical leaves, it's not at all this and the elusive cryptocorine crudasiana which was described long time ago but never seen after and suddenly rediscovered very few years ago. So this is probably Cryptocorine crudasiana, a very poorly known species. And uh, now I don't see inflorescence but I have to check more carefully if I can see some spatas in this beautiful tuff. So we see the inflorescence of this cryptocorine, probably cryptocorine crudasiana. We see the tube, which is very beautiful, totally silver, white silvery tube, very shiny. And the open spata, which is almost black, so dark purple and very warty. We see the wart on the border is a little bit shiny and uh, a long, quite long tube. So this is a very special cryptocorine. The spata is beautiful, no? Ah, the spata, spata is incredibly beautiful. Incredibly black, almost black inside. The tube also totally, totally metallic. And uh, I see also the kettle and we see a dark purple part inside the kettle. And also the other side of the spata I did not see is a mix of a yellow and purple. Just after discovering the Cryptocorine Crudasiana, the Myanmar, Myanmar beer is the best thing to do. C'est incroyable. It has a stiff leaves but they are totally covered by a, a brown stripes. These leaves, we see they are totally striped. These. So here we see clearly mixed population of the 
green, green leaf form. Here a big patch on the brown leaf form. So it's uh, exactly in the same environment. So of course it's uh, not a difference uh, according to, to water depth or lighting. They are clearly brown and green forms. Oh, this is Cryptogorin crudasiana. On this boardwalk just above this uh, muddy area, I want to check if these are the common Barclaya motleyi or the very rare Cryptocorine elliptica, which is known only from two places this place and another a little bit more southerly. So I try to have a look without disturbing. The area. Alors, this is unfortunately, I see from here, it is Barclaya Motlevi. All this population, which is much more invasive. Ah, but here, what is this here? So difficult to, to see sometimes the difference. I try just to stay like this and to check. No, it's Barclaya. Again, Barclay Amotley, but hopefully we have seen the true cryptocorine elliptica. The big problem, of course, is all, all the pecaries foraging everywhere and returning every single. Hopefully, this cryptocorine is one, is the only species which can regenerate from a broken leaf with an adventitious bud at the base of the sheath of the leaf, but in spite of that, if uh, it's totally uh, destroyed, they cannot recover. I, mean, I tried to recover a little bit, yes. Okay, but hopefully Cryptocurrency Elliptica is still here. From the boardwalk I see Cryptocurrency Elliptica, a beautiful Specimen, a very, very beautiful individual of a cryptocorine elliptica. Unfortunately, there are no flowers. Yes, I can see a little bit better from here. Well, yes, uh, no inflorescence. Some others are growing in the shade under the boardwalk. I'm very surprised. I just arrived in the Katien National Park. And first, I see these shrubs, and you think, of course, as usual, it was supposed to be a Homonoya riparia, the very common 
<sighs> plant of a, a phobia C family and when I look I see it's totally different but this I look after but here what I see and it say looks like cryptocorine but it is a cryptocorine but I'm very surprised because according to what I didn't know they were supposed not to grow in a so southern area of the Indochina Peninsula. So here we are really in south of Vietnam. And I see this cryptocorine. And according to what I know, it seems the only one which should be possible should be a cryptocorine Mekongensis. Of course, we are not far at all from the mouth of the Mekong River. But uh, I'm surprised to see this uh, cryptocorine in so southern area. So I'll try to see some inflorescences if by chance I can see some of them. Actually, I'm also much intrigued, not by this one, because this one I know it very well, it's Homonoya riparia. But much intrigued by the other shrub of the same size, also with many branches coming out from the base, and which has tubular flowers which open light yellow and after turn dark pink. Obviously, it's as clepiadacé because we see leaves are verticillate by three and when we cut one leaf, there is a white milky sap flowing out, typical of all the Apocinacé sensulato. Leaves look like another real thick member of this family of Apocinacé. It's, uh, but it's uh, living in the Andes of uh, South America. It's a Tevesia peruviana, which is grown everywhere in the world. And also the laurel, the Nerium oleander, also has narrow leaves like this, and also is a rheophytic shrub. So we see that this family in Europe, in South America, and now I did not see this in South East Asia, did uh, allow the evolution of rheophytic shrubs. Very exciting for the first sight in Captier. Raining, but uh, I'm looking at the uh, aquatic uh, plant at uh, the Barclay along the Polia. You know it very well in uh, southern Thailand, for instance. But this one is almost black, almost black leaves, totally dark purple on their surface. It is very black. Everybody can think it's a dead leaves, but it's not dead leaves, it's a living plant <laughs> growing perfectly well in this uh, small forest stream. Oh, I'm here what I see. Uh, oh yes, I'm quite the coral is here. One has very beautifully, totally crinkled leaves. I can just... Uh, like, it's totally dark. Oh, I've never seen uh, this uh, kind. This is a group of Cryptocanicris patula, but uh, this one has leaves crinkled, totally undulated, and also lower surface is totally brown. And this is not at all usual for this uh, species of Cryptocanicris. It has a wide distribution, so in this area of southern Vietnam, it is still 
another type. So here we see a mixed population of uh, the Barclaya and the Cryptocoline. So this uh, Cryptocoline Crispatula with very dark brown leaves but totally alive. And what is very interesting, we see the inflorescences of uh, this uh, Cryptocoline. So we see totally twisted limb of the spata, of the spat, and <coughs> the dark marks inside. So it's typical of Cryptocoline Crispatula. Usually the variety Balancae, but Balancae usually has much longer leaves and not so dark brown. So it's related to Balancae. But here also we see the leaves of the Barclaya, of the Barclaya longifolia, totally mixed. And here I have seen the flower, flower of the Barclaya. Here we see just emerging out of the water the flower of this Barclaya, a totally different family because Barclaya is water lily family, Nymphaeaceae, whereas Cryptocorine is Araceae. Here I see maturing fruit of Barclaya, which is a fruit. Once flower has been pollinated, the flower is going down in the water for maturing the fruit. So, Oh, here a big fruit, just close to the flower, we see a maturing fruit, and here the flower. After 24 hours of rain, we can easily understand what it means to be a real fight for a shrub for an herbaceous plant because when we see this uh, homonoia riparia totally uh, flooded on the, with the branches uh, torn by the current of the water but actually in spite of everything resisting due to the flexibility of the stems resisting to this so strong currents. <laughs> 